right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Missouri Rural Stakeholders Engagement Meeting hosted by the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Missouri Rural Health Association. My name is Melissa Van Dyne, and I get the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director here at the Missouri Rural Health Association. Before we start today, I do have a couple of housekeeping items to go over real quick. As you just heard, the session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to the registrants within a week or so. All the participants are currently on mute. So we ask that you submit your questions in the chat box located at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, since we all can't do formal introductions with a group this big on Zoom at this point in time, if we can allow participants and speakers to follow up with you if needed, if you could go ahead and make sure your full names with the name of your organization is on the participant list. So if you don't know how to edit your name in Zoom, you just go to click participants down at the bottom, and then you click your own name on the right-hand side, and it should give you an option to click rename, and you could do that there. If for some reason you can't figure that out, if you could put it in the chat, that would be great. So the purpose of these stakeholder engagement meetings are for participants to hear from and network with our various federal and state agencies, and then have organizations serving rural communities um, get to know their state and federal um, agencies a little bit better and get more comfortable with them. So please let us know if you have any organizations that you'd like to hear from or invite in the future, and we will do our best to make that happen. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce Nancy Rios. She's the Regional Administrator of HRSA's Intergovernmental and External Affairs Office in Kansas City. And Nancy, I will hand it over to you at this time. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Melissa, for the introduction and for your partnership. I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so highlighting a few HRSA open funding opportunities to support projects in rural communities. Um, but before I do so, I want to just remind folks who we are. So next slide. The Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, we are an agency of the Department of Health and Human Services. We support more than 90 programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically challenged. And we do this through grants and cooperative agreements to over 3,000 awardees representing community and faith-based organizations, colleges and universities, hospitals, state, local, tribal governments, and private entities. Our programs work. Every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people. Next slide. So my office, my office is the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs, we used to be called the Office of Regional Operations, but just about a month and a half or so, we changed our name to the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. We serve as the principal agency lead on intergovernmental and external affairs, regional operations, and tribal um, partnerships. Our office works across all HRSA programs to extend the reach of the viewers and offices and to provide an additional touch point uh, for HRSA's um, stakeholders. Our role is different than any other component of HRSA as IEA does not award or manage grants or cooperative agreements. We are just ambassadors, HRSA ambassadors, where we provide outreach and education with the goal of increasing the reach, the impact and awareness of HRSA programs. We also gather and assess a ground level intelligence about healthcare issues and trends, and then we inform our leadership about those healthcare issues and trends that impact our hair sub programs and stakeholders in the hopes that we can make changes in, to ensure that our programs make sense for our communities. Next slide. Since we are jacks of all trades and there's no wrong door with IEA, Intergovernmental External Affairs, again, we love our acronyms. As HRSA ambassadors, we can assist by brokering relationships and connecting you with stakeholders, HRSA programs, resources, technical assistance, and funding opportunities. And because our network is so um, broad and, and, and great, uh, we definitely can connect you with other federal partners and even with some 
other community-based organizations or faith-based organizations or tribal governments to uh, with whom you might want to partner to engage in different projects. So here, this slide, have, you can see there are a few reasons why you might want to contact IEA. So let's talk about funding opportunities. Next slide. First, I want to uh, talk about round three of the community-based workforce to build COVID-19 vaccine confidence program. This is hot of the press. Um, the application for this program is due December 10th, 2022. The intent of the program, if you recall, is to mobilize community outreach workers, and that includes community health workers, patient navigators, and social support specialists to the most vulnerable and medically underserved communities, including racial and ethnic minority groups. Community outreach workers are gonna be expected to educate and assist individuals in receiving COVID-19 vaccinations. And among the activities that we expect those community outreach workers to do is to not only educate, but also assist individuals in making vaccine appointments, providing them resources and assisting those individuals with transportation or other needs to get their, to their vaccination um, appointments. HRSA will fund applicants that have demonstrated experience and expertise in implementing public health programs across geographic areas. There will be only nine awards up to $10 million per awardee for the ninth month period of performance. And that period of performance will run from January to October. Missouri is one of the 25 states that have been deemed high priority for activities under this program due to both the low vaccination rates and high rates of unvaccinated but willing to vac get vaccinated populations. So more details about this program will be shared with uh, potential applicants during an FYHP TA call. And again, this program is under the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, I believe. Um, they will be having a TA call on November 18. If you want more details about that TA call, you can click on that live link on that PowerPoint, and that will take you to the notice of funding opportunity. You can download the instructions. And I believe on page three or four, that's when you will find information about technical that technical assistance webinar. The next one is the Rural Residency Planning and Development Program. And the application for this program, it's due December 20th. The program aims to increase opportunities for physicians to train in rural residencies. This program provides the startup funding to award recipients to create new rural residency programs that ultimately be sustainable long-term through viable and stable funding mechanisms such as Medicare, Medicaid, and other public or private funding sources. Um, eligible applicants include rural hospitals, community and faith-based organizations, GME consortiums, and tribal organizations. The next, funding opportunity that I want to talk just briefly about is the HRSA Delta Region Rural Health Workforce Training Program. Application for this program, it's due January 25th. HRSA expects to make three awards with total investment of $1.4 million for training critical administ administrative support in the rural counties and parishes of the Mississippi Delta Region. As you all know, Missouri is one of the states that are part of this Delta Region Authority region. Um, so when we're talking about uh, the training of critical administrative support through this funding, uh, we're talking about uh, funding to train medical coding and billing specialists, folks that are working on claims processing, information uh, management, and clinical documentation. There was a TA call help that's actually a TA call going on today, uh, but there's always uh, ways for you to listen to that recording. If you look at the notice of funding opportunity there on that notice, notice of funding opportunity, you will have the information to listen to that recording. The next is the Rural Community Opioid Response Program, which Missouri is very familiar with this program. You have many grantees of our corp, um, and Melissa actually leads one of those uh, B group uh, of grantees that comes together to exchange information. As you know, this is a multi-year initiative aimed at reducing the morbidity and mortality of substance use disorder, including opioid use disorder in high-risk communities. The applications for the implementation grant, and you probably know this, but I wanna remind you, uh, the application is due January 13th. 
HRSA will be making approximately 50 awards of $1 million each to rural communities to enhance prevention, treatment, and recovery from substance use disorder. Um, HRSA is holding a TA webinar today as well as a 90 minute long webinar. So you can access the recording again by going to the notice of funding opportunities and pulling um, that information out of that NOFO. Next is the Rural Health Network Development Planning Program. Application for this program is due January 28th. And actually this program falls under Catherine O'Malley's group, the community-based um, division. We will be making approximately 20 awards of $100,000 each for one year of performance to promote the development of integrated healthcare networks. And that is to achieve efficiencies, expand access to, coordinate and improve the quality of basic healthcare services, and also strengthen, strengthen the rural healthcare system as a whole. There will be a TA webinar on November 17th at 3 p.m. Eastern time to p.m. Central time. The session also will be recording. And again, on that slide, you have active links to those notice of funding opportunities to the NOFOs, uh, to grants.gov. So there you can find the information about this, uh, the TA seminar, uh, webinars, I'm sorry, that are coming for this programs. Also, I wanna mention that uh, IEA Region 7, we are gonna be holding a grants writing another grants writing training session. And that upcoming session, it's on November 18th at 10.30 in the morning, Central Time. Um, no, it's not November 18th. Um, Kim, I'm probably going to have to go back and uh, post there the, the right date. I know it's in December. Bottom line, the, this next session on grants writing is going to be focused on the elements of a notice of funding opportunity. So if you're planning to apply for any of the grants that I've been talking about, that might be a good session for you to go to because um, we have a great speaker that will be walking folks through one of our notice of funding opportunities and then just um, providing examples of how to address some of those requirements. So we will post that information about that upcoming grants writing session in December um, in the chat, and we'll be sending you information as a follow-up to this um, call. Lastly, I wanna mention that we have the Small Healthcare Provider Quality Improvement Program that has been forecasted. It's not been released yet. And the purpose of this rural quality program is to support planning and implementation of quality improvement activities for rural primary care providers or providers of healthcare services such as critical access hospitals or rural health clinics serving uh, rural residents. Residents, I'm sorry. These activities include providing clinical health services to residents of rural areas by funding projects that coordinate, expand access, maintain costs, and improve the quality of essential healthcare services. I look at past projects funded in Region 7, and I notice a significant number of them are focused on care coordination projects related to diabetes, hypertension, behavioral health, remote patient monitoring using telehealth. And also we have uh, used the funds to support awardees uh, doing activities related to um, achieving patient-centered medical home designations and actually doing implementations of the PCMH model. I encourage you to subscribe, next slide, to um, grants.gov to be notified by email when that small healthcare provider quality improvement program is released. Um, and also, I would encourage you to view all notice of funding opportunities and look at uh, the grantee directories um, in the Rural Health Information Hub site, because from that directory, you can then learn more about past funded projects and or ideas, innovative ideas for future projects, as well as evidence-based models. So here in the slide, you have the two main sites to get information about HRSA grants. Next slide. And then here's my contact information. And But before I turn it over to Melissa, I want to just do a quick plug. Next week, it's her, uh, it's National Rural Health Day and HRSA will be celebrating National Rural Health Day. We're gonna be hosting a webinar to celebrate the day on Thursday, November 18 at 10.30 in the morning. Um, we're gonna have our acting um, administrator, Diana Espinosa, participate on this webinar, but also we're gonna have federal speakers that will be sharing strategies 
activities and resources related to achieving health equity in rural communities. We're also gonna have some grantees do some showcasing of best practices. Um, they're gonna be part of a really cool um, panel discussion that they will be then engaging on describing different projects that are uh, tied to health equity. There are other events scheduled for the whole week so I will be posting the link there for our HRSA National Rural Health Day webpage. So you can take a look at all the events that will be happening during that week. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. I know there was just a lot of information and uh, I think 15 minutes or less, um, but we will be, I promise you we'll be sharing with you um, an email with additional information, live links, but I wanna make sure that you all aware of what's coming what's already open, what's coming, and then reach out to us. We can help you connect to some of those resources. Um, we can um, engage with you and, and helping you partner with others. So here's my contact information. Please do not hesitate to reach out to, to us. So Melissa, take it away. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, I would strongly encourage, if you have questions about any of the funding opportunities or how to go about applying, um, or even how, how to go about building your consortium, um, Nancy and her staff are always willing to help you do that. So please reach out to them um, anytime you have those questions. So next, um, let me introduce our next speaker. And this is Ms. Catherine Umali. And um, Catherine currently serves as the director of the community-based division within the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy within the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. Uh, in this role, she is responsible for providing leadership, management, and programmatic oversight of the community-based programs and initiative within HRSA's Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, or I lovingly just refer to it as FORHP. <laughs> um, so Catherine, thank you very much for um, joining us today, and I will turn the reins over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Let's see, can you all hear me? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, 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 provide an overview of a new funding opportunity that we are um, doing at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Um, it's um, uh, the, the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity is not um, out yet, but um, hopefully um, it'll be out soon. Hope, we're thinking end of this month or December, um, but um, it's still going through clearance. Um, so next slide, please. So as part of the American Rescue Plan, uh, the administration directed about $52 million to support a workforce initiative focused on rural public health workforce. Um, and so our intent um, in doing um, uh, this presentation um, to you all is that to really get the word out and make sure people are aware um, of it and to start thinking about how they might be able to put together an application if they have an interest in this topic. Because what we're going to use is a network approach toward reaching this goal. So again, we're still in the final clearance process of the Notice of Funding Opportunity. So I'll talk in very broad, broad strokes about what we hope to do. Um, and so there may be slight tweaks on the actual um, Notice of Funding Opportunity when it's released, but conceptually it should be the same. Next slide, please. So out of the $52 million from the American Rescue Plan uh, funding, we were able to secure about 22 million um, to, and put forth a proposal. And even more importantly, we were able to get that proposal funded. Um, and so what we have here is just kind of a, a broad, uh, broad explanation of it uh, and what we're trying to do. But it does speak to the concept we're using here. Um, so I'm not going to read it word for word, um, but what we're proposing to the, what we proposed was that we wanted to use um, a network approach in which we link together organizations in education, workforce training, development, and the ultimate end users of hospitals and clinics, and that they should all be together in a network. Um, so um, there will be four tracks um, on this, uh, in this program, and I'll talk that uh, more in detail about that in the next few slides. Next slide, please. 
So again, we realize how challenging it is to put together um, like a workforce network and kind of figure out a governance model. So again, we're doing this, the NOFO is not out yet, but we want to provide ample time for potential applicants to put their network together. We don't want to have to have this spring up on you um, you have, or spring up on potential applicants and having them scramble to put together a network or um, a conceptual framework of what they're trying to do. So really, again, our intent here is to give you a head start of thinking through some of the tough issues about who should be part of your network. Um, so as I've mentioned, we're hoping that this NOFO gets released in um, uh, this month, the end of this month, if not December. Um, and hopefully, we'll, if we're on track, we'll be able to make awards in the summer. Um, it's a it's a multi year project period, um, and um, we're hoping to make around thirty to thirty one awards. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned before, there are four tracks to this program. Um, track one is focused on community health workers, since we found that community health worker models work effectively in rural areas. The challenge, of course, has always been sustainability. And so what we wanted to do was to see if there was a way to sort of modify the notion of community health workers a little bit and cross-train them um, other activities that might make it easier for the organization or facility to see the direct benefit and be able to justify supporting them long-term. So re really, it's kind of expanding their role as just like the traditional community health worker um, role. And so what we wanted to do here was encourage applicants to think about how they could expand the role of community health workers in their organization. So, you know, can this, you know, could they cross train them to be a navigator? A lot of our, um, the projects that we fund already do that. Um, you know, what kind of community health workers still do all the stuff they do with the community health workers, but could they be cross trained to do benefits counseling or coding or billing support? Could they do charting support, um, kind of like a scribe, so that the clinician seeing patients can focus on the patients and not the paperwork? So we're really looking for kind of out of the box ideas, um, in addition or besides the traditional, um, you know, community health worker role. Um, and we want to see if people can test out these concepts. And um, we're really interested in around patient service coordination and how this track could benefit that. Um, and really, this is an exciting track out of all the tracks because I think it leave, leaves a lot of room um, uh, and flexibility to expand or enhance this role in addressing um, social determinants of health. Uh, next slide, please. Track two is focused on community care medicine. And again, the fundamental concept applies here in that how can we expand or enhance um, this role to benefit the community and organization. So this track is a little bit more straightforward because there are community care medicine models already out there. Um, and historically, we've seen community care medicine programs work really well. So for this track, we would like applicants to think about leveraging the community care medicine curriculum to perhaps targeting at-risk populations. So for example, can they do home visits and get a sense of whether somebody who's isolated um, you know, needs more services and then be able to report back to the clinical team, you know. So again, that's kind of a little bit of expanding and remodeling the, the curriculum. They do health screenings in the community. Um, and then again, the intent here is that by implementing these community-based preventive and risk reduction strategies, we're reducing the factors that, let's say, you know, drive the admissions and, um, emergency department utilization. And in turn, that's a benefit back not only to the hospitals and clinics, um, because the reimbursement, so much of the reimbursement is now being tied to value-based goals, but also to the community. So again, in essence, with this track, we're hoping that applicants can use the existing curriculum and training materials um, to expand this model and moving forward. Um, next slide, please. So track three is focusing on health information technology, telehealth, and technical support. So, you know, as you all know, with the expansion of health IT and telehealth, providers are dealing with and needing more of a robust level of technical support. So for this track, we want applicants to look at the technical support aspect of it and the training aspect. So looking at making sure is there a sufficient capacity to provide equipment support. 
looking at maybe up training staff to adapt to the evolving technology, making sure clinicians and support staff are accurately using the technology. Um, going back you know, to what I mentioned before about cross-training staff, this may be used to do that as well. This could also be used to develop a health IT curriculum or certification. Uh, next slide, please. Track four is focused on respiratory therapists and case management coordination. So as we're dealing with um, the pandemic, we wanted to have a track that really thought about the long-term impacts of people, um, of people who've had COVID. Um, and as you know, one of the long-term effects that we're seeing with COVID is respiratory problems um, and um, exacerbations of chronic disease. And so we wanna lean in on the respiratory focus role because um, we know that you know, number one, there's a shortage of respiratory therapists in rural areas, and there's going to be a need for, for, for this um, uh, role or occupation moving forward. Um, and so for this, the intent is for the applicants to expand the training of respiratory therapists to include long-term effects of COVID. Um, and then in addition to the respiratory therapy, we thought there'd be uh, an opportunity perhaps to also do case management because these patients are likely to need long-term care so this would assist in um, already a, 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 a you know, tight workforce in these facilities. We also know that rural areas suffer from higher rates of chronic disease. And so there's a need to coordinate services for these patients. So again, this would go back to the same concept as track one, which is, is there anything that we could do around case management formation for clinically and, um, and then more broadly around the social determinants of health? Next slide, please. So one of the one of the eligibility requirements of this program is to you know obviously partner um, uh, partner with at least two other organizations. With the nature of this program, we've seen you know um, more than two, obviously. And here are just some of the partners that you may want to consider for your network. Um, you know, we've talked to our colleagues at the Department of Labor, and they've urged us to really include the state and local workforce investment boards that are funded through the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act programs. That's an example. Um, another example, maybe call community colleges. Um, the challenge will be figuring out what other entities might be natural partners for this. So, um, you know, you might want to reach out to your uh, Rural Community College Alliance. Um, um, and also, we've listed um, some organizations here that may play um, a factor in addressing the social determinants of health. Um, and, and, you know, we may think that, or you may think that it may be natural partners um, for this program as well. Next slide, please. And here's just some a summary of the things that we, we just talked about and, and think that you may wanna consider if you're interested in applying for this program. So, um, Again, you know, uh, network approach. Um, think regionally, think scalable, um, ensuring obviously that training, placement, and employment, um, all of that stuff has a direct benefit um, to uh, the rural uh, partners or network partners and ensuring that, um, you know, it addresses the social determinants of health and uh, addresses the health disparities in your community. The next slide, please. Um, and, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to, um, I'm not going to go over all the other slides. These are just resources for you to, to think about. I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with the state offices of rural health. That's uh, next slide, please. Um, um, so it, it, for uh, every state has a state office of rural health. Um, some small states are just combined with others. Um, like Rhode Island's combined with New York, that kind of thing. But this is um, a, a good um, resource for you all to think about. Um, the next slide is the Rural Health Information Hub. If there's anything that um, I want you all to take away from this presentation is this, the Rural Health Information Hub is just a, a wealth of resource for everyone. Um, it has all the tools. And um, if you sign up with their newsletters, you get all the the, um, the, the announcements and the funding opportunities that we have in the Office of Health Policy. Um, and then the next few slides are just, um, again, resources for you all to, to think about the Rural Research Gateways where we, host, uh, where we house a lot of our um, uh, uh, research 
uh, uh, studies that we funded through our rural research centers. Um, we fund seven of them. Um, so that's how's there. Um, and then obviously, um, you have your um, Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. So just wanted to show that to you all if you're not interested, if you're not um, aware yet. Um, and then the next slide is the weekly announcement. So in addition to RHI Hub, we also have these weekly announcement, announcements that we send out. And we only, for this, we only really focus on what our office kind of, you know, funding opportunities or articles or that kind of studies that we're making. Real Health Information Hub is broader, obviously. So if you want to sign up to get those newsletters, Michelle Daniels, um, her contact information is below. On that slide, you can contact her. And I think that's it for me, um, just my contact information. So um, with that, um, I'll kick it over to Melissa. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them as well. Right, so if you all have any questions, um, you can either put them in the chat now or down below. There's some reactions where you can raise your hand if you wanna take um, yourself off mute and ask either Nancy or Catherine um, any type of questions. So Melissa, I'm gonna put Clark Conover on the spot. I received a question Absolutely. from Rodney about LPNs and the NHC program. So Clark, do you wanna just mute yourself and then um, address Rodney's question? Sure, um, my name is Clark Conover with the Bureau of Health Workforce. Uh, a couple of things. One, our traditional rural community and substance abuse disorder uh, loan repair programs open now to the mid of December. I put the link in there. We, we strongly encourage anyone that's in a health professional shortage area at an eligible site to submit that. Uh, next summer, we will also have a addendum to our STAR LRP program, which is a substance abuse treatment program that LPNs or NRNs are eligible to apply for. Um, our nursing loan repayment program will open traditionally in mid-December. Uh, that's an opportunity for uh, registered nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, nurse anesthetists, uh, to uh, certify nurse midwives, to all apply for federal loan repayment, working at any critical shortage hospital, clinic, Planned Parenthood clinic, county health department, uh, anything that, that serves uh, underserved populations. Uh, and again, I put the link in there and you can uh, ask to be uh, notified when that program opens uh, via email or Twitter. Thank you, Clark. It's good to Is see you. Mark, Nancy? Perfect. Um, Rodney, do you have any other questions? Any specific questions about any other programs? No, I was just, uh, and so just to clarify, that does apply for LPNs? Uh, the guidance is not out yet in the past. I believe it has, but the guidance is not out yet. So I don't want to speak specifically to the LPN question until the guidance comes out. Yeah, because, you know, in lots of clinics and rural areas, you know, LPNs mm -hmm. are a very valuable commodity. And if loan repayment is available, that just kind of sweetens the pot when you're trying to recruit and, uh, or even promote from within, you know, if you got an MA or a front desk person, you want to get them in LPN school and they can get their schooling paid for. That's a big deal. So Absolutely. yeah, if we can define if it, if LPNs are covered, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Again, that I, I need to wait till the guidance comes out. Um, I don't know what changes that may be proposed by the administration or the department, uh, or legal and how that pertains to the budget uh budgetary piece that's coming in but once that guidance comes out it'll be available for public dissemination and then that okay. will lay the rules of who's eligible and clark when when is that guidance due to come out back, traditionally mid-december um certainly i i'm not going to predict when that will be but traditionally it's been mid-december but if you go onto the link i put in the chats it'll be sent to you the day it opens you can get the copy of the guidance and a link to the application. Thank you, Clark. Melissa, I'm thinking maybe for our next quarterly, we can have Clark and his group just come and talk about any of those open programs or future. So we can maybe focus it on workforce if that's of interest to the participants today. Absolutely. 
more than happy to. Uh, what I do want to leave everyone here with is our traditional rural community of substance abuse disorder for doctors, dentists, mid-levels um, is all available right now. So please encourage folks to go apply. We want to give we want to give away nearly ten thousand awards uh, over the next six months. I also included like a little synopsis of it there on the chat box. But again, we will follow up with more information about all those programs on our follow up email with the link to the recording and the copy of the PowerPoint. So, Clark, if you have anything else that you would like me to include on that follow up email, I'll be more than happy to do this to do so. And thank you, Clark, for the on the spot um, <laughs> talk talk with us there for a little bit. Um, are there any other questions for Nancy, Catherine, or Clark? Now that we have him and we know he's on there, or myself. With that being said. Um, I want to thank Catherine and Nancy and, and Clark for their time and excellent um, information and remarks. Um, we do appreciate our federal, our federal partners a lot. If you don't know your federal partners, I highly encourage you to get out there um, and, and make connections with your federal partners. They can be um, a great resource and, and technical assistance to you. So at this time, we, we do have a couple of poll questions and we'll use this to inform um, how we do future events and, and what we want to um, give you as far as future events. So you will see, I'm, I mean, I'm seeing it now. So um, if you wouldn't mind, there's just two questions. Um, how would you rate today's virtual meeting? And then will you be using this information learned today to apply for future um, HRSA funding? So if you wouldn't mind doing that, if you have suggestions um, for future webinars, if there's a certain state partner or federal partner that you want to hear from, please let either myself or Nancy know. You can reach me at, um, and I'll put it in the chat, but it's Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A, at M-O-R-H-A dot org. Um, that's my direct email so, um, and I do have one more thing that uh, I would like to remind everybody, or maybe you, you didn't know, um, but um, our, our good friends and our good partners and collaborators um, at the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services Office of Rural Health and Primary Care are hosting a National Rural Health Day celebration to honor the noble community spirit nature that prevails in our rural Missouri. Um, so again, as Nancy mentioned earlier, National Rural Health Day is November 18th. Um, so this event will be held on that day. Um, the Missouri Rural Health Day promotes that power of rural and the ongoing efforts to communicate, educate, collaborate, and innovate to improve the health of rural Missourians. Uh, the event will be held from 8.30 to 4 on the 18th, and it's at the governor's office building ballroom here in Jefferson City. And Kim will also put that link in the chat for everyone. You can also join it virtually. So um, you have two different ways. You can be either in-person or virtual. I do know that the in-person is limited, however. Um, we do hope that you enjoyed today's session and found it um, valuable and informative. And we look forward to seeing you all again in February. I think February 9th, we have scheduled um, as our next uh, quarterly call. Again, please let us know if you have organizations that you'd like to hear from or, or you want us to invite in the future. And I will uh, put my email address in the chat here in just a second.